Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today here on Zoom uh, for this lunchtime together. Uh, my name is Lydia Webster and I'm the Assistant Curator at the Center for the Arts and Religion at the Graduate Theological Union here in Berkeley. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all to uh, the very first of three events we're offering in tandem with our online exhibition, Draw Me After You, a visual song of songs. Uh, before we get started, and I pass over to Olivia Tabert and our, uh, our host for today and our two other panelists, uh, I just want to quickly let you know a little bit more about what CARE does and how you can get involved with us in other ways. There are two of us on staff here at CARE, myself and Dr. Elizabeth Pena. Um, and we offer at CARE two art exhibitions per semester, both online for now. Uh, one of which is the, a collection of artwork inspired by the Song of Songs that we're discussing today. And the other one is opening in April, a collection of artwork by uh, an artist collection of Latin American artists. We also offer events also online for now, such as this, uh, and courses and workshops in the arts and religion. And we do also offer grants for GTU students and faculty members uh, working on projects related to religion and the arts. So if you wanna learn anything more about what we do at CARE, I'll put the links to everything in the chat in a second, and also the link to the exhibition uh, that we're discussing today. So thank you all so much for joining us again, and thank you very much indeed to Olivia for organizing this event and to our other panelists for being with us. Um, so Olivia, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I am super excited about what we're doing today. It's gonna to be a little bit of informalness and formalness kind of mixed in. And um, first of all, I'm really excited to introduce our three panelists. We have Jamie Letourneau, who is an amazing, uh, let me just read the bio real quick. Jamie Letourneau is a published author, illustrator, graphic designer who creates intentional art to help people navigate and feel the world we explore. Her debut children's book, A Kid's Book About Shame, was chosen as one of Oprah's favorite things of 2020, and she continues to use her work to help others feel less alone in the daily emotions they experience. Much of her work is fueled by a desire to help people feel loved and understood. Thanks, Jamie, for being here and sharing your work today. Um, we also have um, an amazing, uh, writer and illustrator as well, Carrie Dean, Kari Dean, hi Kari. Um, she captures the beauty of ordinary moments through pen and ink. In 2015, she published her first book of drawings called The Art of Walking, an illustrated journey on the Camino de Santiago, documenting each day of a 500 mile journey in Spain. She spent 15 months living, walking, painting, and writing in Portugal, Spain, France and the UK. Her work is exhibited in the Santiago de Compostelo and Finisterre in Northwest Spain. In 2017, she published her second book of illustrations and stories called Portraits of Iona, an artist's perspective in paint and prose from an art residency on Iona, a tiny island off of the coast of Scotland. She also co-launched a podcast called Pilgrim Lost about the belief of the transformative aspects of pilgrimage. And um, she'll be sharing her journeys today with us in artwork. And then we also have another panelist who kindly recorded her part of the experience. So we'll be playing that and that is Karen Thurston, who is a poet, songwriter, podcast creator, and the author of She Will Be With Me, A Love Letter to My Body, which Kari illustrated with just the most incredible illustrations. And um, her work uh, helps reintroduce, re reintroduce us to our bodies through art, poetry, and a guided journaling practice. So thank you so much for our panelists for being here, for your bravery, your courage, and your artwork. And then I'm going to kind of introduce like how I um, got interested in the Song of Songs and like what was my journey with that and why am I kind of obsessed with this weird little book. Um, so I'm going to uh, do a presentation for you guys. One second. And here we go. So, so the goal of today is kind of trying to let the ideas that we have, these theologies and stories 
and epiphanies, like how they affect us from an art practice point of view. Um, and I can't think of a better text to kind of start this journey than the Song of Songs. It's incredibly erotic and body positive and, um, and tells us, and it's part of sacred scripture. Um, so for me, this journey, this journey is gonna be like full of highs and lows. So just come along with me um, and maybe your experience will resonate and maybe it won't resonate, but I'm just kind of trying to share how I became obsessed with this book. Um, so I'm gonna start talking about what happened in my early teens, which is like ideas about gender. And for me, I grew up in the 90s and the ideal, <laughs> the ideal body of a woman in the 90s was someone who had zero body fat and was kind of like real thin and probably didn't eat much than air. And then on the other hand, I got these ideas from culture of what it meant to be a woman. And I grew up in evangelical culture, which part of my uh, evangelical culture is women were really in the background. Women didn't teach uh, children after the age of nine and they were there to be like mostly supportive, encouraging figures in the background. And the theology that I taught around a woman was like the images that I was given was kind of like Eve. She like started the whole thing. Like she started why we have violence and why we have brokenness in the world because she was weak and she corrupted Adam through her weakness with Satan. And um, so that was kind of like a really <laughs> hard thing to absorb even as a kid and as a teen, this, these images of like what did it mean to be a woman from like a faith perspective. Um, in addition, when I think about like, what were the images of God that I received? The images of God was mostly male prayers where he, um, God loved patriarchs and apostles and disciples. And even like in some, a lot of the genealogies, it's kind of like Adam gave birth to Seth somehow and so forth and so forth. It's like sons giving birth to sons, giving birth to sons with very few instances of like women sprinkled in between. Um, and so there are like real and experienced consequences to kind of these two huge influences of like culture and church. And most of, the, most of it is that I became like really awkward growing up as a teen. I'm sure we're all awkward as a teen. There's just no way to avoid that. But particularly from like a theological point of view, I really disconnected from my own body, like thinking of it as good because all that I was taught was that like, flesh is really associated with corruption and weakness. Um, and I really became dis disconnected from my own sense of sensuality. Like what is pleasurable? What's enjoyable? What's, you know, what's, what's lovely. And I think it really also damaged like my image of myself because I was given like this, I really believed in all the things that I was taught. And so it just really hurt like who I thought I was. Um, and then particularly, I think it also influenced my interactions with men because you know we were taught like hey you have to wear basically a sack like make sure you like no curves are being seen because if he sins it's probably your fault because you have curves um and I think it also like really damaged my relationship with like the, the divine or with God because of all of these messages that I was receiving about myself and my gender and my identity um so I left the church basically because I just was trying to really kind of come away with like, why, why do I think this way? Why do I have all these feelings about myself that are kind of dark and heavy um, and hard? So I started asking questions about like, why <laughs> if Christianity or the faith that I'm a part of believes in this incarnation and this enfleshment of the divine, like how do we end up with these really negative images and feelings about our bodies, you know, whether it's from like a, you know, theology or culture or whatever, like how do we end up thinking that flesh equals bad and corrupt? And I know that it says that a lot in the New Testament with the apostle Paul, he really draws those associations. Um, so like, how did Christianity manifest in that way? So I started paying attention to like, anytime the word woman was mentioned and like, what is the story of women that are in the Bible? And as I'm going through and kind of like taking a deeper dive into this, I discovered something that I had never heard of before and never like heard about. Um, the church at large kind of struggles with representing positive eroticism. Like you never hear like in the media or anywhere else, like th this connection between faith and eroticism other than maybe like the Kama Sutra, but 
in general, like Christianity isn't, or Judaism isn't really known for its like huge erotic works of art. Like that's just not a thing. And so um, I, I discover as I'm going through scripture, lo and behold, there's this book that's full of like powerful sexuality. Um, this is a translation from the New Revised Standard uh, Version of the Catholic edition. And it says, you know, chapter one, verse five, I'm black and I'm beautiful. And there's this kind of like powerful reclaiming of the body throughout this book that's really, really strong. And I was shocked to find it because, you know, sometimes Song of Songs is called the Song of Solomon. But when you read it, it's actually the woman's voice who initiates this whole set of like love conversations. Um, she, and I, and I was just like, it was so like mind blowing to find this really body positive, sex positive, erotic book that like just really valued flesh and valued like the breasts and the butt and like every part of the body is like set on like a pedestal and glorified and adored. Um, so anyways, just here's a few little selections like he shall lie all night between my breasts. His fruit is sweet to my mouth. Um, your, your navel is like a round goblet, which is always wet. Like your body is a heap of, um, I can't read that last line, because, but whatever. Um, it's, it's too long on the screen and I see all your faces, so I can't read the line. <laughs> but, um, but lilies is a reference to like uh, the vulva and the vagina area. And so anytime you see that word, like that's what the connotation was back then. And so it's like, I'm my beloved and my beloved is lying. He feeds among the lilies. Like that's a really erotic descriptive, you know, depiction of what's happening right now in this story. And then um, verse five or chapter five, verse four, my beloved put his hand by the hole of the door and my body trembles for him. And then, you know, chapter six, verse two, my beloved is down into the garden, a bit of spices. And this whole, it's just, this whole set of scriptures is just so powerful into bodies and presents bodies in this really positive um, way and there's like no mention of God at all in this text but I found this so inspiring and so liberative that um, I come from an art practice point of view and I work as a graphic designer so I started this um, goal of trying to kind of illustrate the song of songs visually uh, through like yeah basically um, visual narrative and I just started on chapter one and I realized that I needed an education. So I came to the GTU to get an education to make sure that I'm translating and I'm understanding context. But this is really my passion is to complete this work and to complete um, illustrations for the rest of the book, the rest of Song of Songs. But yeah, this is my, my journey into it. Um, and I'm just so grateful for these stories of sensuality and, and bodies and just like how powerful it is to have in our sacred text. Um, to have female agency, uh, to have, it just, it just really is very, very liberative. Um, so kind of the four themes that I, that really resonate with me in the Song of Songs is this concept of embodiment, like just the, the adoration of the body. And then there's also this flow within the story, like it's, it's often noted that it's not like a a real narrative because it's kind of like this cycle like the lovers just kind of like talk to each other and then they talk to each other again and they talk to each other again but it's not like a a one-to-one -one story that has like a beginning middle and end it's kind of like a cycle so I just love this concept of dynamic movement in the story I think one thing that I really also like about the Song of Songs is that it does have like a lot of like community and networks like she starts the story telling us about like her family and there's villagers and there's friends. And it's not like these lovers are like completely isolated. They're like within a context and within a network, and within a community where they flourish. Um, and then the last one is the role of nature in the story. It's just like <laughs> nature can be seen as a metaphor for what the lovers are doing or the fertility of love, but it's just completely saturated in this work. Um, so again, starting with that question of like, how do I let these ideas and these liberative theologies and epiphanies affect me from an art practice? And that's why I brought in also our panelists today because they really do a lot of this work of kind of translating like, how do we let these beautiful ideas about bodies kind of move into you know, the real world? And with that, I would love to introduce Jamie Letourneau and her work 
One second. Oh, and one little last thing. Um, someone once said this to me, like, this really bothers you. Have you made art about it yet? And so that's also an encouragement I would give to our audience today. Hello, everyone. I feel like that question was a really great transition <laughs> to the artwork that I have to talk about today. Um, and a lot of what you were saying, Olivia, I think would have been extremely helpful for me being raised in the ways that I was raised and what's influenced my artwork. And a lot of what I would like to talk to you about today is around an art exhibit that I was a part of a few years ago now, almost four years ago. What is time? But I was commissioned to be a part of an art exhibit called The Invisible Organ. And it was part of a larger campaign called the Kala campaign, which was created by Duke University's Global Women's Health and Technologies Department. And their team actually created a tool called the Caliscope that's used to help detect and prevent cervical cancer. And it's a fairly small tool and inexpensive to make because a lot of what they were um, inspired by to create such a tool was the lack of access to healthcare and just a better system to be able to detect cervical cancer and because of expenses, but also that access and being in rural areas and countries that have less access to it and a myriad of other reasons. Um, and then also a big point that they wanted women involved in creating a tool like that because they understood the pain that women have to go through in everyday exams that they have to go and be a part of to help keep their um, keep watch on their health. And so this team created this art exhibit as a way to help educate a, a greater audience about what was going on with the tool and the benefits of it. And it was really cool that they wanted artists to come in and express this because it's just a different way, I think, for people to understand and interpret the importance and the immediacy of this bigger issue and to also just give a bunch of different kinds of artists creative freedom to express how what it felt like them to identify as a woman and to go through the different issues that everyone has to deal with that it, are very normal things but unfortunately culture has said are disgusting or should be hidden should be shunned all of these negative things and so this art exhibit as a whole was meant to help change the stigma around that, change the narrative into more of a positive one to just, I think also help people identifying as women to feel less alone in those struggles that they have. And so because of that freedom, we could make our art, any medium, and it could be about anything we've dealt with around our health or our sexuality, our bodies, just from simple to complex. And I chose to do a trio of female reproductive systems. I just often just call them uteruses for various reasons, but I took three different areas of my life and examined those and what, and kind of like drew back to how I was feeling when I was a child in like stages of naivety and then through kind of more like teenager years and then into college and into my twenties and late twenties and early thirties. And now I'm 35. So I'll show these artworks. Let me share my screen here so you can have more context of what I'm sharing. Hang tight. Sorry about that. I think it's giving me a permission issue, Olivia. Would you perhaps be able to share your screen? Yes, one second. Leah, oh, go. sorry. If you can go to my, yeah. it's just on my website. I'm going to drop it in the chat. Perfect. As well, and everyone else can look along or look later.
Sorry about that. I think it's a permissions thing with Safari wanting me to quit the entire program. Okay, so these are some detail shots of the artwork. And I used to focus on black ink alone. And I found a lot of like cathartic feelings from drawing in this way because I actually drew back to textures that were in those different periods in my life and tried to find inspiration from that for the textures I was using in the artwork and in the line work. And I also put together music playlists to draw inspiration from that because music is a direct correlation to remind me of how I was feeling during that time period. So like this one, actually if you wanna go back, thank you. This one is the first era from childhood when I was little. And so I, this one, probably can't fully tell, but it's it's more of kind of a soft, fluffy texture to represent that of my innocence and how naive I was. And I came from a family that everybody kind of shoved things under the rug. So nobody actually talked to me about anything to deal with sex or my body, but there was a lot of shame going on and a lack of confidence. And so I, I actually had like a lot of like negative kind of feelings around my body and my own self-confidence. But this one, because of the fluffiness, I actually even found an old photo of a baby blanket that I had when I was a kid. So I was really trying to draw into things that I was surrounded by and brought me comfort in those times. And like I said, with the music, that's what influence you can move ahead if you want to the next one, um, next photo. This one was the second era, more of like my teenage years when I got involved in youth group at church and had a lot of confusing education around, again, my body and how modest I was supposed to be for the, for the men around me to not make them stumble. And so I was just constantly kind of inundated with this education that I was wrong and that I should be ashamed of things I was doing and didn't understand a lot of that that was being like filtered in. And I struggled with that, but didn't talk to anyone about it. So there was just a lot of shame kind of raveling up. So you can see like in the line work and a lot of these becomes like more and more intense and detailed and layers. And this one has even more going on in terms of like switching from different textures and shapes that are influenced by periods in my life from environments that I was in. And um, I grew up in the Midwest. Some of the textures are from farms I spent time on of friends and partners and um, this one was also heavily influenced by the music I was listening to, which was a lot of angsty <laughs> music, but I would just kind of let that music flow with my line work and where I was going with it. And it was, like I said, really cathartic to travel back and try to like assess how I felt at that time and how I felt like some of the teachings I was learning in church were so confusing around how I was supposed to feel about myself and how I was supposed to feel about my own sexuality and relationships with men. And I think that was really hard as a kid and not opening up and talking to people about it. And so then it just kept spreading into my twenties, mid twenties, late twenties is probably when I finally started to unravel some of this and you can move ahead if you want. Um, this is the trio at the art show. There's some more close-ups of the texture that I was mentioning. But that third one is the biggest because that's really where I felt like I finally started to unravel all of that like knotted up tension of, about shame around my body and how I wanted to express myself. And so many of the things I was told were wrong, I finally started to believe and embrace as just human desires and that they were beautiful and that they were normal and I wasn't alone in how I felt about those things. And I could talk to other people about it. I could open myself up and become vulnerable in relationships with partners and also with my friendships. And something incredible happened through it is that because I was vulnerable in sharing these stories in the artwork, um, friends of mine and people I wasn't even close with online and on Instagram where I was showing these and sharing these. And at the art show, they opened up about issues they've had, different health issues, different everyday struggles they've had. So it was really an incredible process to go through this to see like the more vulnerable I was, the more it gave an invitation for other people to open up. And I really appreciated that it 
offered that because I think that I grew up in a culture and an environment in the Midwest that was so like constrictive of how we were actually feeling. And I think a lot of people have gone through that and we're having sort of this awakening now as adults that we're trying to unravel this to help us um, improve ourselves and our emotional intelligence, not just for ourselves, but in the relationships that we're in. Um, so yeah, that was that exhibit. And then that's a good segue into my kids book, which Olivia, if you go to the main page of my website, there's a little thumbnail for my kids book, if we want to talk about that. So about a almost a year later, not quite after the exhibit, I was approached to write a kid's book about a topic that was <clears throat> that I was passionate about and that I wish there had been a kid's book about when I was a kid. And immediately, like I had a list of ideas I wanted to do, but shame was the one that popped up immediately because of everything I just explained in those uterus illustrations I was talking about. And I knew that this would be difficult, but I knew that this was something so important, not just for kids, but for adults that didn't have this kind of resource when they were little. And I wanted to help encourage people of all ages to be able to talk about those like icky feelings that they're not, that they're, they're very confusing, but to be able to like unwind those and find examples of it and just again not feel that they were alone in what they were feeling or feel like they were weird or and then just finding healthy ways to express that and art in writing and in illustrating has always been a healthy way for me to get that out when I felt like I couldn't speak it aloud so this was a book that it came out a couple years ago and a couple <laughs> again time um, but this one is centered around this little main character on the front. Her name is Tilly, and it was based off a character I created. It was a little monster that wasn't necessarily scary, but that it followed you around a lot. And so I've always referred to my shame and other emotions as little monsters. And I feel like everybody has those and we just have to address them and invite them in and not, you know, shun them away, but to actually like talk about them and see what's actually going on in there. And so the book is full of different kinds of things of what shame can feel like and different kind of metaphors, but to feel, to leave it kind of open because it looks different to everyone and everybody feels shame in different ways. So that's, I think that's a good ending, but Olivia, if you have some other questions to follow up, feel free. Thank you, Jamie, so much for sharing the stories. I absolutely love your drawings and how they're kind of imbued with like geography and music and just, I just love your process in that. And I do find it really inspiring and really grateful for your vulnerability and sharing your story. So thank you. And thank you for the artwork that you do. It's really, it's really powerful. You're welcome and thank you. <laughs> Um, so now I'm going to move into sharing um, uh, Karen and Kari's work. And Karen, or yeah, Karen is on a cruise right now, but she kindly recorded um, kind of an intro about the work. And then um, we'll talk to, to Kari about what was it like illustrating that and then some of her journeys as well. So I'm going to share my screen again. And then I'm going to try to see if I can share audio. So please let me know if the audio isn't working. My name, My name is Karen Thurston. I am a poet, copywriter, and lyricist, as well as co-host of a podcast called Heathen Podcast, which exists to provide a safe space to land for folks who have encountered religious trauma or are experiencing religious deconstruction, a faith shift, any sort of unpacking of beliefs that have been fundamental to them. I'm also the author and co-creator of the She Will Be With Me, a love letter to my body journal. Um, thanks, Olivia, for inviting me to come and talk on this topic with my cat friend behind me. <laughs> um, like 
Olivia, and I would imagine that like many of you, I grew up with conflicting messages about how I should feel about my body. Uh, I had on one side media, TV, uh, school, just culture in general telling me over and over again that my 5'11 and a half body should be smaller, uh, thinner, take up less space in general. Uh, and then I had church and evangelical Christianity telling that, telling me that my body was essentially responsible for sin, right? Since Eve at the very beginning, we've sort of been the perpetrators on the sin front, um, that my body was a weapon, that it was capable of causing other people to stumble. And maybe most importantly, that it didn't belong to me, that my body belonged first to God, and then it would eventually belong to my husband. Uh, I was taught a lot of harmful things about how I couldn't say no, uh, that I was owed access, I, I owed access to my body to other people, um, specifically my husband. Um, and those messages did a lot, of, a lot of damage to me. I grew up with disordered eating um, and just a lot of shame and really a deep and fundamental disconnect between my identity as a human and my body. I was two separate beings, a soul and a body. And the link between them almost didn't exist to the point that it was easy for me to ignore feelings and physical symptoms taking place in my body. It's easy for me to go weeks and weeks on end with pain without really acknowledging that I'm in pain at all. Um, and it was really hard for me to talk about my body as a part of me, always a separate entity, never, never a, a piece of me that really truly belonged. So the idea for the She Will Be With Me journal started with a women's event that we were doing. Our, we've got a little unicorn uh, spiritual community down here in San Diego called Sojourn Grace Collective. Um, and we had an event for women and uh, our pastor Kate asked me to write a meditation about embodiment. And I wound up writing a poem that was a love letter to my body. And it felt really important to me to specifically write directly to different pieces of me. So I wrote a love letter to my hands and I wrote a love letter to my feet, which I have a really fraught relationship with, um, and to my breasts, to my legs and to these different parts of my body, recognizing not only their function, but also their beauty. Uh, it, it felt important to me to call these pieces of me beautiful in a foundational and fundamental way, the same way that I would praise a lover or praise my child and want her to feel seen and beautiful. Um, I wrote the meditation, we did it together as a group and a lot of people asked, it, asked me for the copy and wanted to kind of go through this process themselves and have it on their own to meditate uh, and sit with and work through. And so the idea to create a guided journal was born from that. I knew uh, that my co-creator Kari was the only person I wanted to do this with because her art was just the art that needed to be in there for me. Uh, so we took the piece and we turned it into this guided journaling practice. And in this journal, uh, there's the art. It's gonna be backwards because I'm using my camera funny, but there's the art and the poem that go with each piece to kind of inspire folks uh, to get the wheels turning and get people thinking about, you know, what could I write here? Um, and then there are prompts and blank space for people to draw, to write. This prompt says, of the places you've taken me, these are my favorites. And so it's to help you write, uh, to get started writing some notes to your feet. Of all the places we've gone together, these are my favorite places. We wanted to create accessibility around this very weird practice <laughs> of writing to your body, because it does feel weird. It's an awkward thing to do. But for me, as a writer, there wasn't an easier or clearer way to jump in and get started healing this divide. For me, I've always mothered myself by writing. I've always written into the thing that is hardest for me. So the only way I could think to take steps toward reconciliation with my own body was to write to her. So I started doing that. And um, it has been an awkward, silly, <laughs> beautiful, journey. What I love most about having this journal out in the world is the feedback that we've gotten from other women who've experienced identical, honestly, identical stories to mine. This feeling of disconnection that manifests in all sorts of different ways. Their practical details are different between us, but for all of us, that common thread is just this feeling of shame, of being our own worst critic, of 
looking in the mirror and immediately gravitating toward our flaws and pointing those out and thinking negative things about ourselves uh, and failing to miss all of the positive, beautiful aspects of us that our loved ones and our family notice every day. Um, there's a rawness to that wound. There's an ache in it. Um, and, you know, part of me thinks that it was put there on purpose <laughs> because I think that if women especially and if humans in general can get to a place where we are functioning as whole individuals, where we are in unity with our body, where we're not carrying the weight of extraordinary shame with us everywhere we go, I think that's really powerful. I think it frees up a lot of space that we dedicate to worrying about how we look and what we're going to wear and what we're going to do and you know, hiding and keeping ourselves small. It frees up a lot of time to work on other projects, bigger things when my body and I, when my body and me, when my body and I, when my body and I are working in tandem. I'm a lot more productive. I'm a lot less preoccupied. I'm a lot more present and I'm a lot more myself. So this practice for me has been a healing one, an ongoing one, because I have gotten nowhere close <laughs> to mastering this magic. And I don't know that I ever will. I think this is daily work because I think every day we wake up to new imagery, to new posts on our Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever feeds to new advertising everywhere we go that tells us that we're insufficient, that we're not enough, that asks us to pay to become whatever society's current definition of beautiful is. Every day we are met with an onslaught of division. Um, and I think it's daily work. And it's daily work because culturally we haven't gotten there yet. I always say we can't talk about this body reunification uh, goal. We can't talk about having this goal of reuniting with our bodies without talking about the fact that fat phobia and discrimination against fatness is still rampant in society and culturally acceptable everywhere that we go. Um, and until we're awake to that and noticing it, this idea of unifying with our bodies is disproportionately much more difficult for some than it is for others. And there's no equity there. So the work for me is twofold. It's the internal daily work of having these practices, these affirmations, this active work to train my mind to fight back against the messaging that I'm being given. And also the external work of trying to create more equity for all bodies so that the ableism, racism, fat phobia, and all of the other isms that absolutely affect us on a daily basis can be diminished and so that we can start to actually all have sort of an equal shot at doing this work. So I invite anybody and everybody who has shared this experience to do the awkward, silly, silly, silly task of starting to write or draw or any way that you can think of to treat your body like a partner, like a lover, like someone that you would date. The same sort of effort you would put into a new relationship or to maintaining a relationship with your romantic partner. Romance your body a little bit. Tell her she's special and lovely and put in the effort, put in the effort to romance her and to make her feel good. And it's gonna feel weird, <laughs> but the worst, Thing that will happen is you will have wasted a little time and felt a little embarrassed in a place that no one else could see and the best thing that can happen is that you start to actually believe some of the things that you say thanks so much karen for sharing even though she's not here with us i'm so grateful for uh, what she recorded and her vulnerability with us and um she and carrie are Kari uh, illustrated this book, Love Letters. And so now I want to turn to Kari and I'm wondering if, if we can do a little dialogue and um, thanks again for being here. Yeah, absolutely. It's nice to be here. I'm like, I'm, I'm so impressed. Karen, um, I think did that in one recording and I was just amazed because I cannot record. I'm horrible at recording. So <laughs> go Karen. Um, yes, yeah, so Karen wrote the liturgy and then she invited me into the process um, of illustrating it. And um, one of the funny things is that I said no. <laughs> I told her no. I, I, I felt like it was the subject matter that was so precious and I didn't think I could do it justice. 
Um, so about nine months later, I had taken on another project. Um, I just decided to do what's called the 100 Day Project, which is in it's in various forms, but the one that I kind of entered into was a 100 Day Project on Instagram, which is basically doing something creative for 100 days in a row and kind of seeing what comes out of that. And so um, I decided to, I had another friend, I have another friend who's an amazing writer and she would write, just write something, a little something, and then I would have to illustrate it. And we did this for a hundred days in a row. And she wrote a lot about people. And I ended up doing, doing a lot of illustrations of hands and feet. <laughs> so after this hundred days of doing all this drawing, I, I was like, you know what? I, I think I can do this. I think I can take this on. So I, I uh, texted her back and said, have you found anyone else to do this illustration work for, for the journal? And she said, no, I've just been waiting for you. <laughs> so, um, so that's how it worked. So she handed over the completed manuscript to me. And then I set about doing these illustrations. Um, so I, I, you know, Olivia and I talked a little bit about, about what I would talk about and this idea of sort of what was it like for me particularly to, to kind of enter into this work. And I'll, I'm gonna be really honest with you. When I first started out the illustration, um, we, have, we had three women, Karen, and then two other of her really good friends. I mean, clearly when you're doing a book about bodies, you can't encompass all the bodies, right? There's so many wonderful shapes, sizes, forms. We just decided that we would use friends, Karen and her friends would, would be our models so that it would be this more opportunity to enter into something vulnerably, right? We're just showing ourselves rather than trying to encompass all the bodies. So, um, so they would send me, so I sent them some ideas of some poses and some silhouettes I wanted. And they, um, they sent me all of these wonderful, beautiful photos back that I used for my reference photos. So I thought that this was great. We're going along. This is just a wonderful project. And um, it was so easy for me, I think, like many of us to not to my, for myself, but to look outside and saying, oh, my gosh, these women are so beautiful. Look at how amazing they are. They're 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 just wonderful. Um, I think this project is so great. Yes, we need to reconnect with our bodies. So that all went along. I thought I was doing great until I realized that Karen had not written a specific um, note to, to butt and hips. <laughs> and I, I saw this as like a gaping hole. And I said, because this has been my, my issue my whole life. So it, in the sense of something that I personally have not liked about myself. So I'm six foot three. And those words that Karen sort of spoke about in the, like the idea of always supposed to be a little smaller. Well, I, I was six foot three about at about 14. So if you can imagine walking through life being not just, a, you know, a teenager feeling awkward, but being head and shoulders above everyone else, everyone looks at you when you walk in the room. And I had these messages as well coming because I was quite thin that, that, people would come up to me and say, well, wow, you know, like, wow, you're so tall. And then they would follow it up with like, but it's okay because you're thin. Like, I cannot tell you the amount of people that I had telling me that, that it was okay, I was tall, as long as I was this kind of tall. So I very much absorbed those messages and, and really was, I didn't necessarily work on it in the sense that I was quite thin until, but then I hit puberty <laughs> and puberty changed my body. And yes, I was still, I was still thin, but I developed curves in places that I'd never had before. And I'm about 10 years younger than these ladies. And so, and in fact, I just, I just celebrated my 50th birthday uh, two days ago. <laughs> so I grew up in the eighties and, um, and that was, you know, we were, we were moving towards the Kate Moss era and so, but it was still, there was not a lot, a lot of curves. Curves did not really exist in that era. And so as I started developing these curves, I started to freak out because I was so tall, but I wasn't, I wasn't that model thin anymore. And so I started to have all of these different like critiques of my body. And from that point on, and, you know, I mean, when I was skinny, I was, I had nothing. So I was too thin. And now it was just, there was never a point where I was just kind of could just be at peace. Right. So I'm working on this book and um, 
I'm like, there's no hips and butt page, Karen. What are you thinking? She's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't even think about that. I said, we've got to write that and send it my way. So she did. And, uh, and so we didn't have any photos of those, of that, because the girls had already, the ladies had already done the photo shoot. And so I thought, I told Karen, I said, send me some photos. So you, you all would laugh because if anyone had seen our two phones at the time, sometime we were sending, she was sending me butt photos back and forth. It would have, it was very odd, right? <laughs> I have more photos of Karen's butt than anyone, I think, except maybe her husband. So I have all these photos, but they're not quite the right silhouette in the sense that not Karen, but I just, the way I wanted it to look on the page and how it would contrast with the other drawings. And so finally, I just was like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna do this myself. I just, I know exactly what I want. I'll have my partner take a photo of me. It'll be great. So I sit down, I have him take a photo. I'm in the bedroom, hand me my, hands the phone. I said, give me the phone, let me see what it looks like. And I look at the phone and I literally, I literally threw it across the room. <laughs> I was so just, just hated what I saw. And you know, there's not many, we don't, we see ourselves and we look at ourselves in the mirror, but to see a close up of your butt, like you just like, I, I, in that moment, I realized I had done none of the work. I was happily drawing. I was, oh, everyone looks so beautiful. And I hadn't entered into that process yet. And so it was this real kind of rubber meets the road moment where I thought, and I sat there probably for a good week where it's like, maybe I can tell her to take it out. And no, you know, I, I knew, I knew this was the moment where I had to, I had to start making that shift, that movement towards what Karen was talking about. And um, so I finally started to draw and it took me, I did two different renditions, but as I drew, I tried to like with each like stroke of my pen or my paintbrush, I tried to actually do the thing that she was inviting us to do, which was to start loving my body. Now, I think there's a difference too, and Karen didn't necessarily go into this, but this isn't this fault sort of you know, like, oh my gosh, I'm perfect. But really like, I like that. I like the term making peace for me. And so, but as I started to draw and really, really enter into that process of just emotionally trying to connect with my body in that moment, something shifted. And honestly, um, I'm gonna share, I'll just share the screen real quick here. Hold on, I'm gonna scroll up here. Can you all see that? So this is this is my butt, everyone. Um, <laughs> I've not actually done this with a group of people before, so I could still have my butt be anonymous anonymous in the book, but so. And I tried to actually engage in all the pieces of me, not just the shape, but the cellulite and the dimples and all the things I'm experiencing as I'm very much smack dab in the middle of middle age. Um, so I'm gonna, I, I, you can kind of see the work that I do is pen and ink and watercolor, but it really, um, I, loved, I loved using watercolor in this particular way because it gave me this, this softness as well as the, the pen. There's this kind of juxtaposition of my pen work with the watercolor and I've always really liked that combination. Um, but I chose to, I chose to in the, in the book, I'm actually gonna stop sharing now. Um, in the book, which I have right here, um, I'm gonna show you, you can kind of just see on the cover. Um, the, I decided to only use a few colors. So I used my black and white um, pen, and then I used one tube of watercolor for, for um, any, of the, any of the kind of shades of brown in the book. And this is a good, this is a good picture. So, so this is hands, the love letter to my hands. And so I only used one, one particular shade of watercolor, but I really, because I really wanted this kind of, this idea that underneath it all, we're all the same, right? We're radically different, also the same. And so this idea that we could use this one tube of watercolor 
And by adding, adding the water and changing it, I could reflect so many different tones of skin color. And then of course I did add a little bit of pink down here for Karen, but um, I really made this book kind of, I wanted it to be a little bit more um, kind of all of these just, I didn't, I didn't want to have a lot of different colored representation here. So I was really pleased with how this turned out. Um, but all of that to say that in that process, I'm so glad that I didn't, that I had to end up using myself as a model because it actually forced me to enter into this process. Um, and all the things that all of these ladies have shared, like I've experienced all of them. I did, I grew up evangelical as well. Um, and so these things I loved, I think Jamie, you said unraveling, like an unraveling, like a, like, um, I mean, as I said, I just turned 50 and I feel like it's been in these last, honestly, these last five years where I've been doing the unraveling so much later. I'm so glad when someone says I'm doing the unraveling and I'm 22 or, or they don't have to start to unravel. Wouldn't that be amazing if, if they didn't have to unravel or deconstruct some big thing that was, that was this idea of feeling like we're broken. So um, starting to do the work now, this book, project really helped me kind of enter into that. And, um, and I'm really pleased and proud of the work because it's the, one of the first projects that I've done where I feel like literally any woman could pick this up and, and really get something from it. And, um, and so, yeah, um, I will share with y'all um, the link um, that you can go check the book out um, and also share my my artwork site, you'll see a lot of, I have a lot of, I do mostly journal work right now. So I travel and do, well, travel. <laughs> I traveled in the past um, and did a lot of journal work from my travels. And so, um, and I know Olivia really wanted me to comment a little bit on the, the Camino de Santiago. Do we still have enough time? Are we good? Yeah, let's um, let's do it two minutes and then at least have five minutes in case anybody has questions or wants That's to talk. Like, okay, cool. Yeah, so, um, I walked the Camino de Santiago right after um, I had a really hard divorce um, that not that any divorce is easy, but mine um, occurred in 2013 and my sister and I decided to walk the Camino de Santiago um, right after that period of time. And so um, it was a 500 mile trek is, you know, some of you may know about it, some of you may not, 500 miles across Spain and you walk, you daily walk at average, average mileage a day is about 15 miles a day. And I started an art practice on that walk as well, where I was, for the very first time, I started to kind of journal my, um, journal what I was seeing every day. And one of the things that's really beautiful about pilgrimage is it's really, I think the main thing I, that Olivia and I have chatted a little bit about is this, this idea of really being, being in your body is the primary thing you're doing. <laughs> you are walking and that's that's it that's the only responsibility that you have you, you have to get from point a to point b and you're eating along the way which is always fun right who doesn't love eating so you basically get to let go of all these other responsibilities and your life is simplified to this one simple task and what's crazy about the task is being in your body for a eight hours in that day because you are literally in your body you know we we work and we we're not in our bodies right we're in our computers and our minds and our stories and all these things but because you're walking and you're feeling your feet and you're feeling your knees and um you you really get a chance to live in a space i mean for me it was revolutionary it changed my life um for a variety of reasons one is this art practice i started because i started to draw every day but the other thing is just the idea of um really simplifying your life. Um, I came back from that from that pilgrimage, and I, I ended up leaving and traveling for another year and a half because it was just left my corporate job, kind of radically changed my life. Came back from that extended period of travel, and I live. I'm sitting right here in my tiny house. I built a tiny house because I decided that I wanted to simplify things. It really kicked off from that pilgrimage. But the idea that if there's anything that you can do from like a simple walk in your neighborhood is this idea of just being in your body. And I think sometimes we think of being in our body as being like, I'm an athlete or I'm a dancer or something more, but really being in your body is just noticing and being with your body. And so one of the things, um, I have this really beautiful little book by um, 
rest in peace. Thich, Thich, I always say Thich Nhat Han. Am I saying that correctly? I don't know if I'm saying, but the it's a, a meditation on how to walk. And one of the things that he said is just this idea of when you're walking, all you have to do if you want to meditate while you walk is to say, I have arrived with each step. I have arrived. And what that arrival is, is just being present. Because the pilgrimage, one of the biggest things my art practice, any of those things did was that it really brought me to a space of being fully present in the moment. And I think that's what embodiment does, is being present in the moment with with yourself, with your body, with what's in front of you. And so, um, so now, even though, you know, it's the pandemic or hopefully the end of the pandemic, um, I do walking meditation and that has been really, um, something very meaningful for me. And it's something anyone can do in any place at any time. And, um, and it's simple. So, um, I'm going to share those links with you. I'll share my site and then also share the, the, um, the link to if you want to check out the books. So um, thank you, Olivia. Is there anything else that, that gives you? I think that was about maybe three that minutes. So fabulous. Thank you, Curry, so much for that. Really appreciate it. It's really good. Awesome. Yeah. Do we have any questions from the participants about the work or just any thoughts or reflections? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Um, yeah, I just, you know, it was really fascinating to hear all of you. I was just reminded, um, um, my, my wife uh, um, teaches at the Wright Institute, the School of Psychology, and one of her study, one of her students, her dissertation was on um, whether opera singers are being discriminated against being overweight, uh, because there's this whole push for an opera for the singers. And I guess it makes a great deal of difference with their, their body shape, you know, uh, how they're able to sing, and whether they're getting a lot of encouragement to, to lose weight or not. And uh, it struck me as being very similar to the, the topics that you were talking about. And this was kind of insane to have a profession which uh, really <clears throat> would force you to uh, be thin or thinner than what would really help with what you're trying to do. So just a small, a small thought to uh, what you were talking about. And I really loved all, all your art as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. I just want to let um, everyone on the call know David is the, um, the archivist at the GTU, um, who thanks so much to his help. We have the exhibition online. Um, so thank you, David, for joining us. It's great to see you. Um, we do have one more minute if anybody wants to um, have a last thing to say. But if not, I want to say a huge thank you again so much to our panelists. Uh, it was just been fantastic to hear from you all and learn more about your work. Really, really fabulous. And thank you to everyone for joining us, spending this time together. It's been great to be with you all. So thank you very much and hope to see you uh, at the next event. All right, take care, everyone. Bye-bye.